should have two priorities. First is security. And with security, I mean that we need to defend ourselves against new threats. Um, and for example, a new threat is undesirable for an influence by a country like China. And I think there's no one else more than you uh, who's experiencing today what this new threat can mean. Second priority is jobs. Uh, we are now living in a very difficult economic period and every job counts. So I think in our foreign policy, we should promote trade and support our entrepreneurs who are active abroad. Final point, uh, it may, so may sound a bit contradictory, but standing up for our own interests means that we need to collaborate with others, especially our partners in Europe. Because if we work together as one Europe, we are much stronger on the global stage than if we as the Netherlands act alone. So if we work together in Europe, we are much better able to stand up for our interests. Thank you so much, uh, Lubin Bekelmans, and of course also for staying uh, in the time. That's also very important. Uh, and then I would like to give the floor to Jaap Jonkers from the CDA for his elevator pitch. Uh, Mr. Jonkers, you have the floor. Thank you, Maarten. And uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jaap Jonkers, uh, and I'm really great to be joining this meeting on international affairs. Uh, personally, I have great ties with international affairs. Actually, I was born in Bolivia on the other side of the world. And uh, through adoption, uh, I got the chance to grow up in the Netherlands in, uh, in Overijssel. And ever since, I thought that uh, when I was in Bolivia, I was called Pablo. And now I'm Jaap. So it's a bit of a change. Uh, but uh, I think that I want to stand out in politics. I want to root for every Pablo now that is needing chances and that's wanting chances. And now I'm in the position to uh, give those chances. So that's why I'm a candidate for the Christian Democratic Party. Uh, and since uh, my student times, actually, I've been involved in international affairs, um, doing a microfinance foundation uh, with students uh, to help out in Bolivia, in Zambia, Tanzania, and other countries. And also as a military man, I've been able to uh, do great reconstruction work in conflict areas like Mali or in Kenya. And one of the things that I've learned, and I hope it will apply tonight, is that uh, where, the, where people work, they don't fight. And uh, that's something that also applies really to the European Union, where after centuries of conflict, we're now in a great period of peace, and we should really cherish that. So uh, if people work, they don't fight. And that's one of the basic core values that I personally uh, want to bring across. And I'm really looking forward tonight to discuss with you about all these international affairs. Uh, and from the CDA point of view, I can only say that we should never close doors to anybody, but uh, just keeping working together is one of the most important things. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, contribution. Uh, let's go to the, to the next candidate from GroenLinks, uh, Stephanie Bennett. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here tonight with you all. Um, there's no way we can deny that we're living in a global world. Our world is so much different from the world that our great grandmothers and fathers lived in. They perhaps never even saw uh, another country than their own country, while we, before Corona hit us, had the opportunity to travel wherever we want, to easily buy products from different countries and to indulge ourselves in foreign cultures. So living in a global world has a lot of benefits. As GroenLinks, we think globalization is a natural development. But the way in which the globalization took place in the last few decades has had some bad side effects like pollution, increasing power of multinationals, making exorbitant profits and an unhealthy dependence on some great power nations, which can make us more vulnerable. We're not against globalization, but we want it to be fair. And how do we want it to become fair? We want more focus on international solidarity global approach of our climate crisis and very firm protection of human rights. These are just a few of the conditions to keep, to keep globalization healthy. And that's also very important to GroenLinks. Thank you so much for, for, for your contribution and, and your elevator pitch. Let's go on then to Volt, uh, where uh, Bibi Wieling uh, will give her elevator pitch on behalf of Volt. Uh, Bibi, you have the floor. Hello everyone, it's Bibi Bilingha, um, but that's okay. It happens all the time. It's not a very common name. 
as we as we've seen time and time again in the crises we face the netherlands doesn't stand a chance on its own we've seen it with the climate change crisis already the netherlands on its own can't um, make sure that we take on this challenge in the way that it's impactful that's why we have a paris agreement and not an amsterdam agreement but now in the corona crisis we see that not only can we do we need to survive upon the cooperation of different countries we can thrive when we do it really well so as a pan-european party we do this especially European cooperation by having our own party in every single European member state. That means that every policy we discuss and every more moral worth that we give to certain issues, we've discussed with all different kinds of European nations and all different kinds of people. And together we have come to the conclusion that most of the challenges we face right now, and especially the challenges of the next generation, the generation that I'm a part of as a 19 year old, that the current decisions that are being made and viewing, I'm sorry, but the Veve Day, our national, um, uh, uh, our national nationalism and just looking at the national worth instead of rising above that view and saying the challenges that we are facing are international to make sure that the next generation has a planet to live on. We need to cooperate and not just look at our national um, needs. So that's why we as a pan-European party feel that our glance in the our stance in the global world is to cooperate, especially on a European level, to find uh, better policies together and to implement them together. That was my speech. Thank you so much, uh, Bibi Wielinga. Uh, I will uh, improve it in the future. And uh, thank you so much. And I, I, we already see uh, the, uh, the, the level of debate heating up. So this proves something for uh, the debates we'll have on the four themes in the future. But before we get to the four themes, uh, I want to give the floor for one final elevator uh, pitch for this round from Mikael Segai from the PVDA. Uh, Mikael, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, Maarten. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mikael Segai. I'm uh, 26 year old, years old, and I'm currently um, the group leader of the Labour Party in The Hague, uh, and also part-time uh, student uh, development studies uh, at ISS in The Hague. So I'm very excited to talk about my field of studies this evening. It kind of feels like that. Um, but no, it's a political debate and it's important because um, as I've read recently, um, international uh, affairs is the least um, appreciated topic by Dutch voters. Uh, so basically they care the least about international affairs, international solidarity, and uh, for example, development aid, which is very weird because we have so many um, challenges facing as an international community, climate change, migration, uh, the growing in inequality worldwide, and that was all before COVID, and now we also have the COVID crisis. And um, at the Labour Party, PVDA, I will call it the Labour Party, um, we, are, we stand for security, and maybe you wouldn't expect it from us, but we don't only want people to be secure of a safe life, but also um, of human rights and food on the table. And we really believe that for us as Western countries, it's also our job to uh, not only think about ourselves and consume all those resources in, for example, Africa or Latin America, but also to give something back. Um, so uh, international solidarity is a very imp important value for the Labour Party for Social Democrats, and uh, we really stand for it. So I hope to tell you a little bit more about that tonight, and I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this brings us already to the to the to the end of the first round of of elevator elevator pitches. The elevators have have reached the, the top floor. Uh, so now we'll we'll go to the uh, actual uh, four rounds of debate. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll start the introduction of of every theme by uh, uh, a, a quick introduction by Dr. Clara Egger. Uh, I would just before I give the floor to Dr. Clara Egger, I, I just want to remind the people who just came in uh, and didn't hear me with the housekeeping rules that you can send. Uh, questions uh, to me if you have them, uh, and I will try to uh, incorporate them uh, in the eventual debate. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Clara Egger, I would like to hear your introduction about the first theme, the Netherlands and great power politics. 
Dr. Egger, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, uh, Martin, and thanks a lot to all the candidates. Well, in 2018, during its one-year term at the UN Security Council, the Netherlands promoted a so-called constructive multilateralism approach, advocating for a step-by-step -step reform of the multilateral system and a defense of the power of principles against global polarization and self-interest. At the same time, uh, there is no doubt that uh, the Netherlands is gaining a lot from the multilateral system, uh, which is used to promote its own economic interest, sometimes at the expense of a principled approach. To take but one example, the Netherlands contributed uh, 5.4 million euros to the World Trade Organization in 2019 and recorded a 2.9% increase in exports worth almost 13 billion euros. Today, and even if the US election offers a for sure new perspective, the world appears quite far from constructive multilateralism. Negotiation at the WTO are, uh, are paralyzed by great power politics. Negotiation are in a dead hand in Syria. The military coup in Myanmar breaks the hope in a further democratization of the country. And the COVID-19 is used as a pretext to suppress political opposition in many countries. In such a context, which role could the Netherlands as a relatively small power play? Should the Netherlands use a principled stance or adopt a more pragmatic approach towards great power politics? Thank you so much for, for that brief introduction. Um, because indeed the debate statement we're going to discuss for this first uh, round is the Netherlands should take a pragmatic and not principled stance towards great powers. Uh, so now we'll have the, the 30 second uh, elevator pitches about whether or not every party disagrees or whether they uh, have a specific uh, take on this. Um, so I would propose uh, that uh, Ruben from the VVD uh, starts us off with his 30 second elevator pitch on this first debate statement. Thank you, Maarten. It's a very interesting statement. I think it must always be a combination because you must be principled in foreign policy because that determines your goals and it also determines who your key allies are. On the other hand, if you want to get into any result in uh, foreign policy, then you need to be pragmatic. You also sometimes need to cooperate with countries that have different values or different ideas. And indeed, as, as was said by the Dutch government, improvement always in uh, the foreign policy comes step by step. And uh, so you cannot always be too principled because then you are standing on the sideline. And uh, so I think it must always be a combination of the two. Thank you so much. Uh, Jaap Jonkers, uh, go ahead. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, from the CDA party's point of view, we really feel that um, we shouldn't close doors uh, and be pragmatic, but also when there is injustice, make sure that uh, we have, for example, sustainability clauses in the trade contracts or, for example, have a human rights clauses in the contracts uh, and work with um, uh, the economic powers in the Netherlands to make sure that throughout the entire supply chain of companies, we make sure that uh, companies adhere to uh, uh, important issues uh, like pollution, like child labor, uh, and try to do their utmost best to prevent that and to combat it. But I, I think we should be pragmatic in that. And that if we close the doors from, for example, a great power like China, then they're going to produce it anyway. Uh, but then without us uh, being able to control it or to oversee it uh, and to do something about it. So that's our point of view. Great. Uh, Stephanie from GroenLinks, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> As GroenLinks, uh, we think that uh, the one thing that should be essential is to, to construct politics around firm principles. Uh, being pragmatic on itself is not something wrong when it helps to reach a goal, but it should be a goal that is constructed from a principle. Uh, purely pragmatic politics without principles is, I think, uh, despicable. It's like eating pizza without tomato sauce and cheese. Um, so uh, we uh, from Food Links think principles should always uh, matter. Uh, for instance, when we look at a situation in China, uh, uh, it could be an alliance, it is an alliance, but we should always monitor um, um, how they uh, 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 yeah, how they deal with human rights and uh, other other stuff. We should be critical about the freedom of speech and healthy democracy. Uh, so being pragmatic is okay, but you should never ever lose your principles out of sight. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Bibi from Volt, go ahead. As Volt, we think we should be principled, but you want your principles to carry some weight. So first of all, you have to make sure that you are not just the Netherlands. I cannot repeat, repeat enough how important the European Union is, of course, uh, because when we form a united bloc of the European, uh, of the European Union, which is economically a lot more powerful and which is in general a lot more powerful together on a global stage, we can say a lot more and influence a lot more in, for example, Chinese politics. And secondly, we should make sure that we do not walk away from the negotiation table, because you could say that principally to deny, for example, um, uh, exchange of goods with countries that are uh, uh, hurting humanitarian rights, make sure that you walk away and that's good and that's a statement, but it does not carry as much weight as staying at the table, making sure that you know what the development of that country is, what they're doing, that you have contact and that you can still influence them throughout their process. But principles come first, weight behind those principles and then making sure you stay at the negoti negotiation table and not just walk away out of principle. Thank you so much. And uh, Michael from Trevia, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I strongly disagree with this statement. Um, as PvdA, we believe that standing up for human rights, democracy, um, and also the rule of law should be the most important uh, pillar of um, the Dutch, yeah, ex like inter international um, uh, policy. Um, and I will tell you why. I don't know if I said this in the introduction, but my parents are from Eritrea, and um, the EU had a very, very pragmatic. Uh, look on Eritrea uh, to uh, make sure that there wouldn't be any more refugees coming to Europe. And what happened, they sent a lot of money to a very, very dictatorial regime. And that is what happens when you be pragmatic, when you are being pragmatic about your uh, principles instead of uh, standing for them. Because what should have happened was that the uh, EU should have said to the Eritrean government, well, if you guys organize elections, we can help you uh, to develop the country. And that would have uh, resulted in less refugees from Eritrea. Thank you so much. So um, I think uh, it's good to, on this topic to be uh, concrete. So I've heard, for example, uh, Mr. Bekelmans from the VVD say that um, we need to be, uh, we need to cooperate, we can be pragmatic and cooperate with countries with, with different values. But for example, in the case of, of, of Russia, um, what would you say for cooperation of, of, with Russia uh, following, for example, the imprisonment of Navalny, uh, should we still uh, cooperate with them? And if, if so, how? Or perhaps, um, in the back ones, you can uh, react to that. Yeah, so Ru Russia is, of course, is very complicated because there are many different things at play. Uh, human rights violations is one thing. Um, violations of democratic values is another thing. Uh, also, we have MH17 in the Netherlands, which is, of course, a big topic because we have still the process going on and Russia is not cooperating, uh, which is a very serious concern. Um, we also see that Russia is very aggressive when it comes to cyber attacks. Uh, sometimes we read something about it in the news, but if you talk to intelligence officials, it happens all day, all the time. Um, and on the other hand, Russia is also an important economic power. Uh, also for Europe, it is important for some Eastern European countries, but also still for the Netherlands when it comes to energy. So you still need to collaborate and cooperate with them to some degree. But I think if uh, violations of democratic values happen or human rights violations, it is very important that we put sanctions against uh, Russia. And I think um, I can agree with Volt as an, as an example in this regard, is then it's much, of course, much more effective if you do, if you do that as Europe, uh, when you, as the Netherlands, put sanctions on Russia, they will probably laugh. If you do it as Europe, Putin might also laugh, but uh, in a much more cynical way because it can really hurt the Russian economy. Uh, so you need to uh, really, we need to stand up against Russia and we can do this much more effective and strongly on a European level than on the Dutch level. Well, well I'm, 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 I, it's good to see uh, the VVD uh, agreeing uh, with uh, Volt on the, on the first issue. Perhaps it's fair to, to uh, give Volt the floor to, uh, see how, how they react on the, the pan-European approach of, of the VVD. Uh, uh, Bibi, go ahead. 
Well, the pan-European approach of the VVD is something <laughs> I've never heard before. Um, but of course, those, those like were not my words, by the way. Yeah, not, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, you're no. reframing me, but yeah. But you're on camera, so you can make sure that you're not quoted on this. That would be very yeah. dangerous. Um, no, but I, I agree. Um, uh, what happened in Eritrea is obviously an example of something that went completely wrong. But being principled firstly and then secondly pragmatic also means that in the future we should learn from our mistakes. And when we look at countries like China, we can't just say we don't want to cooperate with you anymore because we, we do recognize that uh, you are violating human rights laws, but so much that we completely want to lock ourselves off from your country in general. Because the powers that are now emerging are just not something we can ignore in itself. And we should always speak out against humanitarian rights violations, but as I can only keep pressing, if we do that as the EU, and if we put sanctions on countries like that as the EU, but still stay at the negotiation table, there's a lot more um, power to be, um, uh, a lot more to be influenced than when we just principally say we walk away. And that's the same with Russia. If we ignore the problem, um, they're not going to take us. If we if we don't stay at the negotiation table, they're not going to take us seriously at all. If we do stay, if we make ourselves strong and united, then then we can actually have uh, some influence. Sure. Um, perhaps uh, Stephanie from GroenLinks, uh, you want to come in and, and give us uh, the GroenLinks perspective on this? Yeah, we actually agree on the view of fault uh, that we should strengthen our bonds within the EU, but we should also do that because then we have more um, power to defend ourselves uh, against threats from uh, out of the EU. Uh, but I also think that when you form a, a big uh, a stance with the EU, that you have more uh, power to uh, put in uh, any um, uh, um, uh, overleg, <laughs> any uh, 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 talk discussion. with discussion with, uh, for instance, China. And I work as a psychologist, and I agree with the uh, principle that uh, Bibi told that you should not walk away because when you walk away, uh, then you cannot uh, form a new alliance, and you have already lost. So yeah, I should. Uh, uh, I think that we should stay in the, the negotiation, uh, but we can uh, put sanctions on uh, some stuff that's not okay. Uh, great. Uh, yeah, you want to you want to come in, come in on this with the CDA perspective? Yes, of course. Yep, from the CDA perspective, we obviously also have the C for Christian in the party name, which refers to the reverend side, and also the merchant in the in the Dutch psyche is really strong, of course. So uh, I, I think that this is something that, uh, as a trade nation, we should be really careful uh, in in dealing with great powers. And that's why I also mentioned that uh, when going into trade and going into uh, human rights violations, we should always uh, stay at the table. So in that respect, I do agree with Stephanie in, on this one, uh, that uh, being at the table is always one of the most important things because you lose influence if you don't. But we really should, if there is um, injustice uh, in, in child labor, in, in, in labor camps or in anything, then, then we really should put our hands off it. Uh, and make sure that companies uh, sign clauses or sign agreements or sign whatever it needs to be uh, to make sure that their trade and supply chains are fair for everybody. Sure. Um, so we, we have the first uh, question from the audience from Sven Schurz, who, who basically says, so yeah, of course, uh, talk about EU cooperation on foreign policy is nice. But what about the fact that you need unanim unanimity on uh, EU foreign policy decisions, for example, on sanctions? So how do, for example, your party uh, look towards uh, removing unanimity and moving to qualified majority voting uh, on unanimity? So it's no longer possible that uh, single EU countries are able to veto the entire uh, EU's uh, foreign policy. Perhaps, uh, Mikal, you can say something about that from the PVDA perspective. Yeah, it's very funny because um, I wanted to say something about it already before the question was asked. Because in the discussion, I heard anyone, uh, everyone talking about indeed about a strong Europe and uh, a united Europe. And as much as I really do agree 
uh, with that goal. And I really hope that it will be like that in the future. Right now, that's not reality. Right now, uh, the reality is that we have uh, Viktor Orban in, in Hungary, that there are very strange things happening in Poland. Um, so I'm really worried about the uh, unanimity and strength uh, of, yeah, of Europe as a whole, because I'm not sure if Viktor Orban would like to make uh, a great uh, um, uh, power with the rest of Europe against Putin, for example. So, um, yeah, I found it a little bit unrealistic that, that everyone was talking about it in that way, because I think we have a lot of work to do within Europe. Sure. So perhaps we can go back to, to Ruben from the VVD. Uh, what do you think about, about this issue of, of unanimity? Uh, is, is, is moving to QMV the only way we could do this? Or how does the VVD look at it? It's, it's one important way to do that. Um, not for the whole field of foreign policy, but when it comes to sanctions and when it comes to human rights violations, we agree that we should go to a qualified majority rule because, of the other, because otherwise Europe cannot be a geopolitical player. And we saw it also in Belarus. It took a very long time to respond to that because one or two countries were holding Europe back because there were also other interests involved around Cyprus. Uh, and we cannot have one or two countries taking Europe hostage when it comes to these geopolitical affairs. So, um, as I said, not for the full field of foreign policy, but when it comes to sanctions and human rights violations, we think that qualified majority rule is important. Uh, but, of course, it's not uh, good enough, because if you want to be a geopolitical player, you also need to put other instruments at the table, uh, economically, and when it comes to also to military power. Um, so it's, it's not the only measure that we should take, but it is an important one. Sure. Uh, perhaps, uh, Bibi, can you uh, give the, the Volt perspective uh, on that? Uh, do you agree or, or is that even not enough? Like, how, how far uh, can we go here to, to achieve unity and actual uh, principled approach of the EU? What is your opinion? Well, first, to react on the PVDA, uh, I completely agree. Often we are viewed as uh, uh, unrealistic idealist hippies with the whole, ah, we're going to sing together in Europe and we're going to hold hands and it's going to be cute. Um, but there's just a lot to do. Um, and unanimity is one step within that process. But if we accept that the situation in itself right now is dire and dramatic and too bureaucratic to do anything, then what goals are we gonna set for ourselves? And how are we gonna move forward within these like challenges that we're facing right now? So I think when we as a party say that unanimity has to go or that, that we wanna form a united front, it's because we see that as a goal and as a way to deal with the challenges that we're facing without disregarding that the European Union isn't effective at all right now. But next to that, to uh, answer the first question, uh, we actually believe that we want a foreign affairs um, ministry within the European Union because we think that when you see these gigantic human rights violations in China, you have to be able to be big enough to do something about it and you have to say, OK, as a European Union, when we disregarded unanimity, we are taking a stand and we're standing together and strong in this. And the way to do that is to create a foreign policies ministry. And, and just to as a small technical question, like how would that differ from the EAS? Because, of course, the EU already has kind of its uh, current version of a foreign ministry, the external action service. So how, how exactly would that be different? that we have um uh from what i've known but this is not my specialty is that we have a minister itself uh within the ministry that is the face and that that ministry has its own uh the same as on the national level has its own competencies to uh negotiate to uh create its own opinions about these kinds of crises and to respond with the whole European Union to these crises. Okay, sure. Um, well, I think it's fair to, to give uh, Hunlings uh, also a comment uh, on this, perhaps also uh, from a, uh, a green perspective. Uh, uh, could you say something about uh, the EU, EU's need to stand united on, on foreign policy issue and what it perhaps has to do with uh, exporting the Green Deal uh, abroad? 
Yeah, we're very much uh, striving for unanimity and uh, more unity. Um, so I actually uh, can agree with the Fifi Day. <laughs> and I also think that Volt has uh, a lot of uh, uh, common, we have a lot of common ground with Volt. Uh, but when you see uh, something like the Green New Deal, we have to form a unity to make it work. Uh, so um, yeah, the Green New Deal is uh, the best example in my eyes uh, uh, for something that we need to work together on. And then you need unity, you need unanimity, you need uh, all these countries that have to um, uh, stand for the same principles and the same policy. So I think we can strengthen our bonds um, and not in a way that we lose our uh, own unique uh, culture, but we do need to um, find each other more on some specific green policies. Sure, it's also interesting to see how, how different parties can find each other now over moving to QMV, whereas for, for, if you would ask 10 years ago whether this was a, a real possibility, they would have never guessed that in 10 years time, uh, people would be talking about moving to QMV on, on foreign policy issues. Uh, I've received one question from Juan Pablo who asked, uh, we're talking about great powers, we're talking always about China, we're talking about uh, Russia, but what about, for example, Latin America? I wanted to ask uh, Jaap Jonkers because of his uh, background there, like, uh, don't you also, what is your opinion about uh, taking a step back and looking broader than only Russia and China? Like, what could the EU do to, ex or the Netherlands uh, do to ex have closer ties with those parts of the world? Yeah, well, I think that, and it's really nice that uh, <laughs> I will be able to answer this question as a Bolivian born uh, person. Uh, but I think that when it comes to South America, Latin America, even the Caribbean, we should never forget that there is a, a large population of uh, Dutch people coming from Suriname, uh, coming from the Dutch Antill uh, Islands, uh, and that um, uh, it's not far away, it's actually in the kingdom uh, that these people uh, live uh, and are, uh, well, extraordinary municipalities, uh, Bonaire, Eustatius and Saba, obviously are in Latin America. So we really should uh, focus on Latin America as a continent with great opportunity, great potential. Uh, and something that I want to work on myself because I have great ties with the continent and many countries uh, in Latin America. So I think it's really important and there's a lot to gain and also a lot to preserve because Latin America has the largest rainforest uh, in the world. Uh, it's actually the lungs of the world. So, and I'm also really proud as a Bolivian that uh, part of the Amazon region is in Bolivia. Uh, and we should really try to uh, uphold and sustain uh, the, this tropical rainforest for the sake of the entire planet. That is uh, great to hear. And uh, I'm, looking at, I'm, I'm looking at the time, so I think we have time for, for one last uh, comment on, on this theme. Uh, perhaps uh, from Mikael, you can say something about, uh, we've, we've heard uh, about Latin America, perhaps you can say something about uh, uh, the continent of Africa and to what extent the Netherlands could, uh, where are possibilities for increasing ties uh, with that continent, basically. So uh, Mikael, Marvel, PvdA, you have to Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think, and that also, uh, answers the question about Latin America a little bit more. Um, I think that we should take those countries uh, more seriously because most of the time uh, when we, uh, when you see how the Netherlands look at the world, it's mostly um, that they see that Africans and Latin Americans are poor and should be helped by humanitarian aid. And with the rest of the world, we can do some business. Um, and I think that's a little bit weird. So I think we should take those countries uh, serious as an equal partner um, and also not only talk about how they can, how we can help them uh, fight poverty, but also how we can help them uh, make better um, uh, laws, uh, democratize the countries, uh, etc. So that's what I think. That's great. Uh, well, I think we've already come to the, to the, the end of the first theme. Uh, and the first team already uh, saw some, some heated debate and also some, some agreement uh, among uh, the, the parties. Uh, but we're going to move to, towards the, the second team. Uh, we already heard the EU pop, here, pop up here and there uh, in the first team. So uh, now uh, the moment has come to, to purely focus um, on the EU because the next team is called the Netherlands and the EU in times of crisis. And to kind of give a, a background uh, on this topic, I would like, like to again give the floor to Dr. Clara Egger for a brief introduction. 
Thanks, Martin. Well, the past years have put the EU project under strong pressure. The departure of the UK from the EU following the Brexit vote is likely to have set a precedent and has uh, surely profoundly altered not only UK politics, but also triggered long-term institutional and political shifts in the continent. Everywhere in Europe, um, Eurosceptic parties are on the rise, building on the perception that the EU common market is only benefiting a small, highly educated and economic elite. The EU dream has not become true for a lot of people, uh, underprivileged citizens in Europe, but also at the borders of, of Europe. In the Netherlands, the level of support for the EU has dropped with an approval rate, support rate of approximately 40% which make many commentators fear that the Netherlands could be the next on the list to leave the EU. This domestic situation certainly explain why the Dutch government has led the groups of states opposed to a stronger solidarity among EU member states in Corona times. The next crisis, the economic and climate induced ones are expected to be an even stronger test for the EU project, sorry. In this context, how can we make sure that the EU project actually benefits EU citizens at large? How can solidarity between EU member states be strengthened? Thank you so much, Dr. Egger, for, for your contribution. So let's go to the debate uh, on, on the second uh, debate statement. To be able to address current and future crises, the solidarity among EU member states should be strengthened. Um, so, uh, Let's give the floor first for the first 30 second um, uh, elevator pitch to uh, Mikhail Tsegai from the PVDA. You have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I really do agree with this statement uh, because I don't think uh, the EU can survive if we don't work on the uh, solidarity between the member states. However, um, I think the reason, uh, for example, the support for the EU uh, has dropped in the Netherlands is that the EU has focused too much on economic development for all the member states, but social rights are also very important. So uh, for example, in the Netherlands, you see that a lot of people feel a little bit hostile towards the EU um, and the benefits we get from them because uh, they feel like uh, EU immigrants are coming to take their job from other EU member states. And why is that? Because the wages are not equal in the EU. So um, with things like that, I think, yeah, we have a lot of work to do, uh, but we really should strengthen our uh, bonds with the other EU member states. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Bibi from the from Polt, go ahead. Well, I obviously um, agree with this statement, but I think besides um, uh, being more, uh, creating more solidarity, we should also learn from each other a lot more. We should look at the other countries, speak with other countries, and try to create new solutions to the current problems. For example, if you look at Corona last year, um, we were two weeks behind on Italy each step of the way. Uh, and that's and the fact that we didn't prematurely uh, close our borders or that we didn't create solutions with the EU as a whole, uh, that we didn't communicate with Italy long enough that that Rutte kept holding back on um, uh, big interventions. That's such a sign of us having this, this fear of Brussels or fear of the EU, um, which is making sure that we are currently losing lives and that in the future we are missing out on a lot of great opportunities. So not only solidarity, but working together and learning from each other a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie from GroenLinks, go ahead. Yes, for me, this is also a, a big yes. Uh, so I agree with uh, 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 this uh, statement. Uh, I also share the vision of uh, Mikael, because I think that the last few years, or maybe even uh, uh, for the last decade, uh, EU has focused too much on econ economics and not on solidarity. Um, and um, I think that people in the Netherlands are afraid uh, for the EU and they see it as something that's very uh, far away from them and they do not see the benefits from being within the EU but only see the uh, uh, the the yeah the the painful things and uh, like for instance uh, the uh, one unity of our um, 
uh, euro. Um, so what I think is that we should also tell the people why it's important to be part of the EU and then work on solidarity. Um, I do want to uh, uh, say that we should not only focus on strengthening our bonds within the EU, because also we see right now uh, that there are great powers having a bit of influence already in the EU, like China. So we, we, sh we should be aware of it and we should work on that as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, uh, from the city, yeah, go ahead. Yes, thanks. Uh, solidarity, yes, but it, it is a two-way street. So solidarity is not something that we should uh, give presents and not expect any, anything back. Uh, I think that when it comes to solidarity, we, we should always see it as two hands meeting each other, right? Uh, so what I really, uh, and, and the CDA party also stands for is solidarity, yes. But uh, when, for example, people uh, talk about solidarity, it's always a two-way street. So if some people say no to, for example, taking on migrants uh, from, from the islands in uh, Turkey and Greece, uh, and the Netherlands says yes, that's not solidarity between all the member states. Uh, I think that uh, for the most part, uh, uh, there's not consensus within all the member states. So solidarity is really something that we need to work on, but also something that we need to pay attention to, that there's not a rift or a, a division within the European Union between some member states who always say yes and some member states who always say no. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, Ruben uh, from the VVD, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I think support for the EU increases when the EU delivers. So I think there are some international issues. We talked about geopolitical issues and foreign policy, but also when it comes to migration, security, climate, also economic, uh, economic growth. If the EU delivers, then there is support. Uh, there are also a lot of research is saying that you know, more than 90% of Dutch people wants to keep the Netherlands within the EU. We all saw the Brexit disaster, so I'm pretty confident that's only a very small minority who wants to get out of the EU. I think the moment when people are uh, disappointed with the EU or becoming more skeptical is when some countries like in the Netherlands are, are doing reforms, are incre increasing the pension age, which is of course painful, uh, when we are not um, increasing wages, for example, for people working in health, because we want to keep our government budget stable. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see other countries who are not doing the same reform. So if we want yeah. some solidarity within the EU, it's important that we are all doing similar reforms. Uh, and it's important that uh, we have strong member states, because strong member states together make a strong EU. Thank you so much. OK, so uh, I wanted to pick up on something Bibi said. She said something about the lack of the EU response uh, on, on COVID. And one of the reasons there was a lack of EU response on COVID is simply because the EU does not have any competence or very limited competence in the field of, of health. Um, so in the past, we've seen that crises uh, caused the EU to integrate further to uh, get more competence. Uh, how, would, uh, how would your parties look at the EU getting more competence, for example, in the field of health to in the future uh, combat these, these crises uh, together and collectively. Perhaps, uh, Ruben, you can uh, respond on that uh, directly. I, I, think, I think health is a, is a national competence. Uh, if you look at different health systems within Europe, they are very different. Uh, the, the one reason why we uh, decentralize much of our uh, healthcare system in the land is because we want to organize health close to our citizens. Uh, and make sure that on a local level that it's organized in a good way. Uh, but of course, we have also seen that the EU can have some value when it comes to negotiating with big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so now with vaccines, but also with other medicines, uh, Europe can play a role in these negotiations, can also when uh, medicines are imported from India, from China, they can also play a role in making sure that we have enough stock available because there are big medicine shortages. Um, so in that respect, you can play a role, but healthcare is a national competence and it should stay that way. Uh, so it should stay that way? Uh, well, uh, Bibi, what does Holt think? Uh, should it stay that way or what, what do you think? You're still... Well, yeah. Um, 
that might surprise you, but we don't necessarily think that every solution uh, lies on the European level. A lot of them do. Um, but for example, when you look at Buurtzorg in the Netherlands, when we decentralize um, uh, and try to give power to the people that can use it the best, which is in general what we would like to do, um, uh, the, our medicine system is working pretty fine right now. But when we look at emergencies and medical emergencies, we're looking at a whole different program. So indeed, the European Union doesn't have the competence right now, but we could have uh, discussed together more. We could have, this is a plane coming by, by the way. Uh, we could have learned from each other. Uh, we could have been at the table together. But right now we just completely declined looking at other countries, even though it was so obviously a prelude to what was coming to us. So I don't think we, we I'm pretty sure we don't want the health uh, competency on the European level, but we do need to look at, especially on the short term, uh, what we do need to work together on in emergencies and health emergencies too. Sure. Uh, so Stephanie, how does GroenLinks look at uh, more EU, EU competence? Uh, of course, not in general, but on, on specific issues that matter for GroenLinks. How does uh, GroenLinks look at that? So it's not about only healthcare, but- um, In general. In yeah. general, yeah. We think that, uh, for instance, to talk about healthcare, that should be on national uh, level. But when you talk about the typical foreign uh, policy affairs, uh, we think it should be organized on EU level. And um, climate, for instance, is one thing that we think it should be organized uh, on EU level. Um, and then um, uh, humanitarian uh, or developmental aid, of course, but also when it comes to um, uh, our um, army. Uh, we think that we should form a strong um, a marine and a strong cyber defense, but not a strong army and not a strong air force. And you see that every country on its own has its own rules about uh, uh, their uh, uh, army and their air force. And we think that should be organized on European level because probably when there's going to be a conflict, it will not be within the EU, but it will be with some other great power nation. Sure. Um, so we, we got another uh, question from the audience. Uh, this time it's about uh, the rule of law uh, uh, crisis um, because it, it's a slow burning uh, crisis, but of course it's not uh, less dangerous when, for example, in Hungary and Poland, you, have, you see the, the rise of, of, of illiberal uh, regimes and there cannot be a lot of solidarity with uh, illiberal regimes. But perhaps uh, since uh, the CDA shares on the European level uh, a political faction with the, the with with Orban, for example, the EPP. Perhaps, uh, yeah, from said, yeah, you can say something about uh, the seriousness of this rule of law crisis and what what we can do about it. Yes, of course. <clears throat> when it comes to the 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 rule of law, when you see breaches in Poland and in Hungary, uh, and when people uh, in government try to take on more dictatorial powers. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. And um, uh, even though it may happen under the flag of Christianity uh, or under the flag of uh, being a good Christian, uh, as a Christian myself, I don't believe that. <clears throat> I, I think uh, the, uh, being a Christian is, is, is not a, uh, something that we should um, use to uh, dominate over a population as, as, a, as, a, as a leader uh, of a country. So. Uh, I really hope and I really want to uh, make sure that uh, from the CDA point of view, we uh, stress the point that the European Union needs reforms, it needs to modernize, and it also needs to uh, make sure that the people in the European Union feel the added value of the U European Union uh, more than they do now. Because I totally agree when uh, Dr. Egger in the beginning said uh, that uh, less and less people see the added value of being in it, inside of the European uh, Union. And I think that's a, a, a call, uh, um, uh, a great sign for us to do something about it and go back to the foundations of the European Union, meaning uh, creating prosperity and, 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 and jobs. Yeah, so this is also actually something which came forward in a question from one of the people uh, in the audience who asked, so what can the EU then practically do uh, to be closer uh, to uh, the, the average citizen? Like how can it show more of its relevancy? Uh, perhaps uh, Mikael from the PvdA, you have a practical idea of, of how can we make sure that the, the EU is actually closer and more felt 
by the, the average uh, Dutch citizen? Um, well, first, I would say uh, make sure that you're not working together on a European level with people like Victor Orban in the, in your political party. So that's maybe a, a little bit of critique on the former speaker. Um, uh, but I also think that um, I don't know if Bibi or Stephanie said that, that uh, people are not always aware of the benefits that we have also as a Dutch economy um, from the EU. Uh, so that's one. And also, of course, solidarity is a two street way, but it also means that we should create more equ equality within the EU. So um, if people uh, in Poland or in uh, Hungary cannot put food on, food on the table for the minimum wages in their country and then therefore come to the Netherlands um, to steal job, uh, jobs, I don't agree with that kind of yeah, uh, framing, but however, uh, steal jobs in the Netherlands is obviously very difficult to say to people, yeah, you should be very much happy that we are in the EU because people won't feel it on a daily basis. So um, yeah, I think to uh, make sure that there's more international solidarity uh, within the EU, you should also make sure that there's more equality. And, and what is, what is the, the, the favorite day to think of this? Because uh, for example, uh, recently among the discussions on the RFF, the recovery package, uh, we've seen a very much uh, holding back position of the Dutch government, not wanting to uh, uh, pay too much money for European solidarity. Uh, is this something we need to uh, keep the Dutch citizen in? Or is it basically the same uh, mentality which uh, ensures that the Dutch citizen doesn't really care about the EU? What, is, what do you think, Ruben? Uh, I will come to that in a second, Martin. Maybe one uh, second to answer the previous question. I think if you want to get EU close to citizens, then you need to show concrete results. And it's often difficult for the EU because, you know, it's, it's more abstract and more far away. But when it comes to vaccines, vaccinations, uh, if the EU makes sure that in the short term we get much more um, and make sure that we do not have the shortages that we face right now, I think that could be an opportunity in the very short term to make a difference and to show EU citizens that the EU can play an important role in their daily lives. So I think that there is an opportunity there. Um, talking about the recovery front. Um, so I don't think that when it comes to solidarity, you can tell Dutch people or any person to say, you should show solidarity with someone else. Um, uh, that's something, it's more of a, of a result rather than that you can enforce solidarity on someone. And I think that it is important that if we transfer money through a recovery front like we have set up, uh, that people then also see that there must be something in return for that, or that if we have done the reforms in the past that enabled us to uh, send this money, so to say, that other countries should do similar reforms. So I think it is it's very normal and logical that if there is a big decision, because we are not talking about small money, we're talking about hundreds of billions of euro, uh, which to a large extend are paid by Dutch taxpayers. Mm -hmm. I think it's very logical to get something in return. And by doing that, we will strengthen European solidarity because if we don't, then the next time uh, populist parties will be much bigger. And uh, we have seen that in the past. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to give the, the, the final uh, floor to, to Stephanie from GroenLinks. Uh, perhaps a question follow up, follow, following up on this. Um, is it perhaps the case that we are just simply not explaining to the EU citizen enough what they're getting out of the EU project? Are we not yeah. focusing a bit too much on the costs? Rather, I'm just putting this out as an idea. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I just wanted to address that because I think that coverage in media is also very slim. Uh, if we're talking about uh, the EU, there's a lot of attention for our Dutch politics, but not as much as for the EU. But I think that EU politicians should also um, um, uh, pay more attention to just explaining what the benefits are from being in the EU. And um, another thing, because I work as a psychologist, I'm always busy with someone's identity. I think one of the problems of the EU is that not that much people identify themselves as an EU uh, uh, inhabitant. Uh, they think, oh, I'm Dutch, I'm German, I'm French, but hardly anyone thinks I'm a European. So that in itself also makes that there's not that much of uh, an attachment to Europe. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, when, now you've mentioned European identity, I think it's only fair that we give uh, Fault one final chance to say something about uh, the EU identity. Uh, I can see you're already wanting to say something very badly. So, uh, Bibi, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. In general, I think what we've not really addressed is that, as Stephanie just said, there's a narrative in the Netherlands where our second chamber is inclined to shove problems away to Brussels. And then as someone who was a candidate in the European parliamentary elections, I noticed that Dutch people just don't have an interest in the EU. So we know that there's work to do, but when you as a second chamber and as our national parliament are inclined to have a very negative narrative uh, uh, and the second chamber itself and our national parliament doesn't speak at all about the positives of Europe, but just kind of uses it as is like this like dark shame corner where all problems go to be born. Uh, that's what you get. You get Dutch people who feel like Brussels is the origin of all our problems instead of um, our national politicians being nuanced and trying to narrate what is happening in Brussels and trying to expel this idea that the people we choose to represent us in Brussels are not the people that we chose. Because when we talk about the European Union, like it's somewhere that's far away from us, that's a different body, that's completely separate from the needs yeah. of the Netherlands. Um, we forget that we have chosen people and ideologies to represent us there. So I think our narrative is a very good first step in this uh, road. Thank you so much. Well, I think uh, we have come to an end uh, for, for the second theme. Uh, probably some parties could talk endlessly about the EU, but of course we have other uh, important subjects uh, on the agenda to talk about. For example, which is actually the third theme uh, of this debate, migration and development assistance. So I would again like to give the floor to Dr. Clara Egger to give a brief introduction on this topic. Thanks, Martin. So it is estimated that in 2021, to this year, a record 235 million people will need humanitarian aid and protection globally, which represents a 40% increase, mainly due to the side effects of the corona crisis. Yet, although they are growing, current aid resources are still insufficient to meet those needs. Based on current projections, half of the people in need risk being left unsupported in 2021 due to a lack of aid resources. This will mean that a large number of people uh, will be left without revenue and will have no choice but to leave their home to survive. In this context, the current Dutch approach to migration mainly focuses on containing migrants in their region of origin while claiming to address the root causes of this statement. Yet, so far, Dutch development aid has uh, mainly be, been coupled with trade gains and benefits for Dutch multinational companies. In practice, little resources are channeled to tackle the causes of global inequalities, be they political exclusion, predation of national resources or corruption. If the Netherlands um, wants to do more and, and really tackle the root causes of, uh, of poverty and migration, it should take a much more active stance in the global fight against global inequalities. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Egger, for your contribution. Um, that brings us to the third, the, the, the third uh, debate statement, which is the Netherlands should take a much more active stance in the fight against global inequality. Um, so again, uh, our 30 second uh, elevator pitches, and I would like to remind our politicians that uh, it's very good uh, to be brief. It's only an elevator and once you're at the top floor, you have to leave, of course. So uh, let's start this time with uh, Stephanie from GroenLinks. Go ahead, you have the floor. Yes, yeah, I totally agree with the statement. Uh, for me and for GroenLinks, this is very logical. As one of the most rich countries in the world, we have a responsibility to help and fight against inequality. And we can and should do this by proper developmental aid. Uh, and we can also focus on a healthy and steady embassies because they have a vital function in countries abroad. Um, so yes, we agree with this statement. Thank you so much for, for, for being punctual and brief. That's very much appreciated. Uh, Bibi from Holt, you have the floor. Yes, uh, I completely agree too, um, especially because uh, it's even 
pr principally, we of course agree, but pragmatically, this is also the best solution you can take on. Uh, if we're looking at climate change by 2050, I think I've read we're going to have like like 400 million more refugees. It's going to be exponentially larger amounts than that we've encounter, encountered until now. And we're already unable to handle the current amounts of refugees. And we should look at the EU in where it facilitates uh, this inequality. For example, when we look at African farmers and we subsidize our farmers so gigantically that African farmers could never enter the market in a way yeah. that is sustainable. So yeah. we agree, sorry, I wasn't brief. Uh, you know how elevators work. There is no way to argue with, uh, with an elevator. Um, Mikal from the PvdA, go ahead. Yeah, I really do agree with this uh, uh, statement as well. Because I think as uh, the Netherlands and a country with a very uh, rich history of trading, international trade, but also uh, colonialism, we have a, a, a responsibility to take care uh, of the rest of the world. Uh, and also not forget that we use the resources of developing countries every single day, when we eat, when we use our phones, when we uh, travel, always. So um, it should be a little bit egoistic to say, yeah, well, that's not our pro problem because we are causing it. So uh, that that is on uh, sustainable development. But on migration, I think it's very important. Uh, well, the Labour Party thinks that too, fortunately, <laughs> that we have a uh, humane, but also realistic uh, migration policy and that, that it is more organized within the EU. So I think there should be a uh, European asylum system because right now, um, how it is organized it's within the EU is not fair. Sorry, I will stop. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. We'll have enough time to, to expand on this point uh, in the debate itself. Uh, Ruben from the VVD, go ahead. Yeah, of course, we all are against, or we are all um, in favor of fighting global inequalities, but let me be a bit realistic here because some of the things that were said are a bit dreamy. Like, even if we spend 100% of our GDP and not 0.7% on GDP, there will remain inequalities. So I, I think we, we need to really look at how can we help countries developing, how can we help countries growing? And we think that trade, and by making sure that people can, uh, that entrepreneurs can set up businesses, can grow, uh, that it's a much more effective uh, lever, much more effective instrument than simply sending money because we have done that for decades and decades. Um, and as I think it was uh, Mikkel said in the beginning, let's not look at Africa and other uh, continents like countries and, and continents that only need our help, but let's look at opportunities for doing trade that are both beneficial for Europe and for the Netherlands and are also beneficial for developing countries. Thank you. Uh, that's very clear. Uh, and then as the last elevator pitch, uh, Jaap from the city. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, thanks. Well, I've been working in the NGO uh, and microfinance sector in uh, Latin America, Africa and Asia for the past 15 years. And one of the things that, uh, that struck me most that there are two things that are really effective when it comes to uh, combating uh, uh, inequalities. The first one is jobs, just creating them, uh, making sure that people have something on their hands, uh, potential uh, for the future. Uh, and the other one is uh, female rights. Uh, all across the world, uh, we see that uh, when we give uh, women uh, rights uh, for education to work, uh, uh, societies uh, prosper. Uh, so I really want to focus on uh, our international development aid uh, on those two issues. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that during uh, the first uh, elevator pitch, uh, Mikkel also touched upon the case of, of, of Eritrea uh, and the things the EU should do to better there. So perhaps um, uh, Mikkel can very practically give a, a few uh, examples of how we can, in the opinion of the PVDA, better uh, tackle these global inequalities but not uh, make the mistakes of the past. Uh, perhaps, uh, Miko, you can uh, say one or two words on, on that. Yeah, well, um, I think uh, the previous speaker uh, pointed it out a little bit. However, I do not agree uh, fully because, yeah, jobs are important, but um, people can have work and still be very unhappy with the 
uh, with the situation in their country. And Eritrea is a very good example of that uh, because they're the governments, they have a communistic government and the government really makes sure that everyone has something to do. And still people are very unhappy with their, uh, with the, with their country and the situation there. So I think that, that it should be not if, um, well, um, economic um, help or uh, democratic help but it should be both. So we should help countries to um, to give power to their to the youth, to their people, to uh, uh, make sure that there's democracy, but also that the economy is uh, yeah is going well. So uh, I think it should be both, and that's I think the best way to um, fight global inequality. And um, and Stephanie from GroenLinks, what do you think about this fight against global inequality? Is there perhaps also a a climate uh, green dimension, which we could uh, connect to, to this fight against uh, global inequality? Yeah, I think there is. Um, if you look at pollution worldwide, then you see that the Western countries are the biggest contributors to pollution. Uh, so I think uh, that we should change that, but we also need to change the effects on our pollution on some countries in, for instance, Africa, South America. So there's an inequality that Western Europe and America or USA is causing a lot of pollution, but there's a lot of uh, pain uh, uh, from the effects in Africa uh, and uh, uh, Asia, etc. cetera. So, so we should uh, keep that in mind uh, when we're fighting these inequalities. Um, to uh, just um, uh, say something about the, the last question, what I think we should uh, be aware of is that we do help these countries, that we do uh, give them developmental aid, but that we should uh, be aware that we don't uh, force a Western model on uh, their society. Because I think that's what went wrong for uh, uh, went wrong for some, sometimes in history, that we um, were too arrogant, that we thought we could fix problems if uh, countries would change their ways and would do it exactly like us. So yeah, we should uh, uh, help them, but we should also give them enough space to just um, hold tight to their own identity and their own uniqueness. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Bibi from from Volt, uh, what is the, the the EU perspective here? Uh, would you say that the fight against global inequalities is, is only solved? You can, you can only solve it in EU cooperation, or what does Volt think of of this statement? Well, we think especially that we have a responsibility um, to look at the different continents around us and especially to look at the countries that are that we are currently influencing and making less stable or or giving uh, a, a weaker chance to develop um, and to what uh, what has been said in, by the past speaker, uh, which I noticed was that we have to be careful that we're not becoming this crusader. So I completely agree with Stephanie that inequality is a very important issue to address, but we shouldn't be like the US was in the Middle East where we just kind of break up every country that we see out of this kind of righteousness idea. But we do have a responsibility, for example, when we're talking about Africa, that we as Europe, as Europe, have completely plundered that country and left it in sham or country, uh, a continent, <laughs> of course, sorry, uh, that continent and left it in shambles. And right now we are still upholding that inequality, for example, um, in agriculture by giving them very little chance to compete with us. So we not only have a responsibility for the years and decades that we have destroyed uh, civilizations, but we have a responsibility to currently um, try to restore that and give these countries a fighting chance uh, to develop. Yeah. So one of the, the, the parts of this uh, theme was also migration. And in a, in a context of, of fortress Europe, where we see, for example, with the, the Turkey deal, we see kind of uh, the external borders uh, of the EU being strengthened also, for example, with uh, the European border and Coast Guard. Um, in context, for example, with uh, the Moria deal and the the, the, the amount of refugees which are, are, are still uh, in, in countries such as Turkey, uh, Lebanon, or on these islands such as, as Moria. Uh, what can the Netherlands do more to, to, to what can the Netherlands do to, to address these uh, often uh, terrible situations and contexts and 
what what is in your opinion for example of the Veve day something we can do uh, to address these streams of, of migrants perhaps uh, Ruben if you want to respond yeah now so with what we see now of course is that most refugees find shelter in the region where uh, uh, in, in their own region, uh, millions of people are in, uh, in, in refugee camps and in, in other uh, areas. Um, and we see that a small part of those refugees are coming to Europe on a very uh, tough and very dangerous journey. Uh, many people are losing their lives at sea. Um, what we also see is that the people who are coming here are, the, are not the ones that are most vulnerable because if you don't have any money and if you're unhealthy, they are not able to, to, to travel to Europe, then you're staying within that refugee camp. And I think that's a very unfair system uh, and that's not something we should preserve. So I don't think it's good to have an incentive for people to come to Europe themselves on such a, on such a dangerous journey. It's better to provide shelter and to help people uh, in the region. And then of course the, the burden will be on the region and we can we have ways uh, as Europe to uh, help uh, those regions and to release the pressure by giving more uh, development aid, by also resettling the most vulnerable people to, uh, to Europe. Uh, but it comes both ways at the same time. So we need to have migration deals like we did with Turkey. Of course, execution could be better, but we need deals like that with other countries as well. But, but to press you a little bit, because you, you mentioned uh, opvang in the regio uh, or like making sure that they are accommodated there. But of course, that's kind of the status quo, right? That's exactly what's happening in, in Lebanon, in Turkey. There are millions of refugees there. So what can we do differently rather than like call for basically what's happening now? So what practically could we do to, to ensure that the situation there uh, improves basically? Yeah, so as I said in the beginning, like the large majority of refugees is staying in the region. But there's also still a large number coming to Europe. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of people on an annual basis. And we see that it's that is causing difficulty within Europe, not only because of the number, but also because it is so uncertain how many people are coming here. So there is a lack of shelter, there are a lack of housing for people coming here because we don't know how many people are arriving every day. So what we are saying is provide shelter, provide, uh, provide it in the region. Uh, and if you do that, and if you um, do not give people the incentive to come here themselves, it becomes much easier to resettle people in a more uh, controlled and in a more a better managed way. And you don't have these dangerous journeys at sea where people uh, are drowning. Uh, okay, sure. So, uh, Mikal, we, we, we have heard this from the FEVA day. We need to avoid uh, dangerous journeys uh, at seas. Um, what do you think of, of, of this perspective? Uh, uh, what could be, uh, do you agree with, with, with what the, the VVD has just said or do you disagree? Um, well, I have many family members who uh, unfortunately felt the need to uh, make those journeys. So I really do agree, of course, that we should make sure that no one ever feels uh, that they have to uh, go on a very dangerous boat trip to make sure that they have a better life. So that's, that's, for, that's a first. But when I hear the VVD talking about uh, development aid, I just really don't think that that's the solution. And also, I think it's a little bit contradictive because um, Mr. Brekemans was saying that uh, poor people don't make those journeys. So why, then why would they need development aid is my question. But um, however, I think a lot of uh, people um, work on their way uh, to Europe. So in Sudan or in Lebanon or uh, in Egypt, they work and then they, they just scrape all this money together to make sure that they can come to Europe. And the reason they do it is because they have no alternative. My parents came here 30 years ago, also had to make a dangerous journey. And in 30 years, nothing changed. So people still have to go walking through the desert on those boats to make sure that they can go to Europe. And I think that's very weird. And about uh, shelter in the region, yeah, well, I think it's very clear that that's not working. That's all I have to say <laughs> about thank that. You, thank, matter. You for your, thank you for your, for your uh, passionate uh, defense of that. Um, perhaps because I'm looking at, uh, looking at the time and we have, of course, the last very important topic of climate change and sustainability to, to still touch upon. Uh, I would like to give the, the last floor to, to Jaap from the CDA. Uh, and after that, we'll move to the, the last team. So, uh, uh, yeah, you said, yeah, you have to floor. 
Yes, thanks. Uh, well, when it comes to migration and the root causes of it, I really feel that we should do our utmost best to create peace in the world. That's also why I joined the military in 2011 to uh, make sure that where there's conflict, we should uh, help people uh, over there and, and try to bring peace uh, and to reconstruct areas where there's been uh, great destruction um, uh, by war. So, uh, and I also think that uh, when it comes to migration uh, and the root causes of it, uh, we should really help those who need it most. Uh, and when it comes to migration and, and um, uh, people who are coming to, to Europe, we should really uh, be open for those who are fleeing for war. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we should also make sure that we have a realistic point of view to those people who um, uh, are not entitled to, to come to the Netherlands. Um, and make sure that there is plenty of opportunity uh, uh, anywhere in the world. So, and that's also something that I've been doing on a personal level mm -hmm. with the development aid and by joining the military to make sure that in every country, wherever you live, uh, that there is opportunity. And I think that speaking for myself as, as someone from Bolivia, uh, as an adoptee, uh, it's many, much in the news lately, uh, but there are many people who prefer to stay in their home country and don't want to travel overseas. Uh, so uh, I really feel that uh, we should re respect also uh, the idea of uh, building up regions and building up uh, stable countries. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to, to close off here, but I, I, I got a question from the audience, which I think is, is pretty apt, uh, because it says, um, but why then did the CDA vote against the Moria deal? Uh, so perhaps, uh, yeah, if you can give a quick response to, I know this is a very touchy subject, but I think it's still important uh, since you are also representing the CDA to kind of give the view uh, of the CDA. Yes, of course. Well, I think that when it comes to the Moria deal, it also touches a personal level because I was an orphan when I was uh, a little baby. So uh, I was uh, placed somewhere on the street and brought to an orphanage run by Catholic nuns. Uh, so uh, when having the choice of uh, saving someone uh, from a miserable life in a camp without parents, I really feel the humanity and, and the need uh, also on a personal level to vote for orphans to come to the Netherlands. So, uh, but this is really something uh, that not everybody in the CDA party agrees, but it's something that I'm morally obliged to uh, because of my own personal story. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think this is, uh, uh, we don't have any more time for, for talking any more on this very important subject, uh, which brings us to the, the last theme of tonight, which is uh, also, I mean, of course, uh, uh, a very important uh, subject, climate change and sustainability. Uh, this year is the year of, of COP26, an important climate conference. Uh, it's the year that the United States came back uh, to the, to the, the world on, on climate action. Uh, so it, it's going to be an important year on climate, and it's going to be therefore also important to hear what Dutch political parties think what we should do about it. But before we get to that, uh, Dr. Egger, please give us an, an, a small introduction of uh, this topic. You have the floor. I will be short. So globally and at the uh, EU level, the Netherlands is, is at least rhetorically taking an active role in climate and sustainable development policies. The narrative of the country below sea level is used to convey the urgency to engage in climate mitigation and support the adaptation efforts of global South countries. The reality is, however, uh, more nuanced. In January 2020, the Dutch highest court concluded that the Netherlands is doing far too little to urgently and significantly reduce emissions in accordance with its human rights obligation. Compared to other countries, especially in Europe, the Netherlands dedicate a large share of uh, aid budget, 32%, to climate uh, programs, but they barely aim at supporting adaptation efforts, which are key to ensure global South countries can fight against poverty in a sustainable manner. 2% of Dutch uh, bilateral aid actually focuses on uh, en environmental issues as a principal objective, compared with an average at the OECD level of 11%. Overall and beyond rhetorical commitment, the Netherlands still appear to do too little and too late on climate and sustainable development issues. 
thank you so much, uh, Dr. Egger, for your, for your last contribution of tonight. Um, so let's again have very, uh, looking at the time, let's have very brief uh, elevator pitches. Um, let's go and start uh, with Ruben Brekelmans from the VVD. And of course, the debate statement is, the Dutch policy towards climate change and sustainable development is too little, too late. So, uh, Ruben, you have the floor. Yeah, I, I don't agree with that. I think over the last four years, we have done more than ever. Uh, we have a climate agreement in the Netherlands with a 49% reduction, which has been created by our uh, Minister of, of Economics and, uh, and Climate. Um, of course, those plans further need to be specified. There are many people in many sectors working on that, but we are on the right path. And secondly, and maybe even more importantly, we have um, made a deal on a European level for a 55% reduction. And our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, played a very important role in that. And I think, of course, that's, that's even more important for uh, our impact because what we as the Netherlands do is relatively small compared to what we in, in the entire Europe can do. And so I think we have done very much over the last four years. And it's always easy to set higher goals and to be very critical, but it's in the end all about the delivery. And I think that's what we have been doing over the last four years. Yeah. So yeah, from the city, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I also feel that in the past four years, uh, also the city party has done a lot uh, together with all the coalition partners to make sure that climate uh, has become uh, a bigger priority. Uh, but I also feel that much needs to be done. Uh, and I feel that from the side of uh, the energy transition, we should take a more broad perspective and not only focus on, for example, uh, the, uh, the way that energy is, uh, is, is created, but also on the amount of energy we use uh, on consumerism and also on, well, let's also face it, that, that uh, every person on the planet needs energy, uh, wants ambition, wants prosperity, that's a really difficult question. And I think we should really crack our heads on that. Yes, perfect. Uh, Stephanie from CoinLinks. I'm, I'm sure you have uh, some thoughts on this statement. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I agree that it's too little. Uh, and we have actually pretty damn late on it as well, um, but it's never too late. And it should never ever be an excuse to keep doing nothing or keep doing uh, uh, not enough. Our goal, our GroenLinks goal is to attain a European CO2 uh, emission uh, reduction of 65% in 2030. So it's a bit more ambitious than 45%. Uh, right now, there's a European tax for CO2 emissions, but we want another complementary tax. Um, and we think the current one is too low. As we know, the fossil industry or just the industry is too much fossilized and that's one of the biggest polluters. So they should be taxed the most. Um, as we all know, pollution does not stop by our border. Uh, and so an international approach to control our climate crisis is absolutely yeah. essential. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, Bibi from Holt, go ahead. I agree with Stephanie that it may have been too little, but it's not too late. I think we've known for a long while that this is a very urgent problem and have not acted on it, but it's much more efficient to look to the future. Um, so I agree with almost every other candidate, um, but I wanna to add to that, that we need to look within Europe to see uh, which country can use most of certain uh, tactics. So for example, we really want to use nuclear energy and it's a, probably a really good source of energy for us, but the south of Italy could very much use solar energy because it's so hot and it has a lot of space. So let's look within Europe, let's learn from each other and let's combat this together. Thank you for your elevator pitch. And then last but not least, uh, Mikal, from uh, PVDA, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a colleague who always say who is always saying, yeah, it's very difficult to act green when the numbers in your bank account are red. And I really agree with that because I think the biggest uh, fail of the climate policy of this government is that they uh, fail to uh, enhance the the just the normal average Dutch person mm. to also be able to live more sustainable. At right now, it's very expensive to make your home more sustainable. For example, if you are a tenant you and you don't own your house, you, ca you can't even do anything. So I think that's the most important thing. And I really agree with uh, Bibi that we should also look within Europe 
to see what we can do better. Um, and I'm very happy with the uh, uh, the new green the green New Deal <laughs> in Europe, and I think that should be leading us also as as the Netherlands to do better. So yeah. I can be very sure about it. <laughs> Great, thank you. You were you were you were on time. Uh, you already mentioned a bit uh, Frans Timmermans. He's of course a, a member also of the PvdA. Um, so looking at uh, his actions on the Green New Deal. You could say he's one of the most powerful Dutch people in Europe right now. Um, what has he done right? And what could he do uh, better from uh, your perspective? Do you have any uh, comments on, on how he, what he perhaps could do better, even though he's from your party, but perhaps uh, you have certain, as a Dutch uh, politician, you have certain comments about it? Yeah. Um, well, I think... I'm, I'm, I'm really very proud of him, obviously, because I think he's doing a great job. And I also think that it's very nice to see that someone from the Netherlands, not only from my own party, but from the Netherlands, is doing such influential things when it comes to climate change. Um, however, I was a little bit critical about the plastic soup uh, part of the policy, because uh, now in the whole of Europe, I think plastic straws are uh, are not allowed anymore to use. Um, and I, I had the feeling that that made more people even more hostile to uh, live more sustainable because people were, were very annoyed that they had to use paper straws at McDonald's. I don't know. I mean, I can't be bothered. I don't care. But uh, some people were very annoyed about it. And people don't have the feeling that they have ownership when it comes to sustainable living. And they only have the feeling that things um, uh, that, 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 they, that, that they are losing things. So uh, maybe that is something that he should have done in a little bit later stadium so that people would have the time to um, look at their own lives themselves first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So something I've noticed is that when we're talking about climate change, it's often phrased as a as something which is very costly, something which costs a lot of money, which you know we have to penny pinch about. But perhaps if, if looking, look, looking at it from a different perspective, we could also see it's an economic opportunity. You know, uh, what is the economic? It, it could be an entire business model creating innovation. So looking at at tackling climate change not only as a, a costly affair but something which where the innovative dutch economy could really profit from uh, perhaps uh ruben uh you could say something about where do where does the favorite see opportunities rather than only costs when it comes to, to climate change yeah, I, I totally agree with you uh, martin happy <laughs> i'm happy to invite you to join the dvd when, when this is your, your personal opinion now uh, of course there are there are big opportunities here um, when it comes to technology when it comes to energy also in agriculture there are multiple opportunities and i think if we talk about investing in um in in, in fighting climate change i think a very large majority also of EU funds, but also we have on a Dutch national level, we have programs for that. We should invest in innovation because I think that will be the major driver to get uh, to uh, carbon um, uh, emission reductions. Uh, and indeed, as, as was said before, it's also a way to make sure that our bank accounts stay green as well. Uh, and it will have a much stronger effect if we are able to combine it and to have green growth. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I'm not sure if it's a, if it's a good idea if uh, moderators uh, start to be invited by by uh, <laughs> the political representatives. I'm not sure if that's a good sign or, or a bad sign. But uh, let's let's directly go on to the next uh, political representative, um, because uh, perhaps Bibi from Volt, uh, you can say something about the, the Green New Deal going on right now. Of course, that's one of the the biggest things on the EU agenda right now. So looking at it from the Volt, from the pan European perspective. Like, what do you see going right about the European Green Deal? And what do you think could be improved about it? Well, I think what is going really right right now is that we are working together very much. Um, this has been a process that has taken some time, but where all different countries had their say and where they produce this together, which makes it inherently powerful because it's supported by so many people. We, I do have to note that we do not support the biomass burning because we do not think it's very uh, efficient and that nuclear energy is still such a subject that is undiscussable. Um, 
is not great from our standpoint, but in general, I think it's something to be very proud of, especially when you look at the whole Euro skepticism, uh, EU uh, identity. Um, it's pretty cool that we brought something forward from all of our countries, which we stand behind. I think that's something, something to be proud of in general, uh, even though it has some flaws that we do not agree with. Yeah. So I think uh, throughout here and there during the, the elevator pitches, we've, we've touched upon the topic of, of nuclear power. Um, so uh, Stephanie from GroenLinks, do you think that nuclear power should make a part or should be part of the, the energy mix of the Netherlands going forward or should we purely focus on renewables instead? Stephanie, uh, yes. Yeah, we should not focus on nuclear power. Uh, we're not a, a, a big, uh, or actually we're against it because we think it's too risky. And it has a lot of beneficials, but if it goes wrong, then that's catastrophic. So we're not for nuclear power, uh, but that leaves, uh, leaves us with a big challenge. So how are we going to get there? How are we going to uh, get to uh, uh, this reduction? And I think renewable energy is uh, very important in getting there. But I think hydrogen is also very uh, promising. And to make a link with the uh, question you told us or asked us about uh, economic possibilities, I think hydrogen is a major possibility for our province of Groningen. I don't know if you already know it, but we had or we got $90 million from the EU to develop Groningen into a hydrogen valley. Um, and that uh, leaves up with a lot of opportunities for creating jobs and be a real front runner in uh, creating hydrogen based industry. So no, no nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, power for us. That, that's very clear, uh, at least. And I, I see that Bibi from, from Volt is already, is already be, being a bit sad about that, but perhaps uh, you, can, you can find each other in the, in the coalition talks uh, when need be. Um, so I want to give the final floor to, to Ja from the CDA to, to give uh, uh, his perspective on, uh, on this issue. Uh, uh, ja, you have the floor. Yes, well, uh, I want to come back to, if I can, on, in, on innovation. I really feel that uh, uh, the going green uh, is, not, is something also that uh, we, we not only in the Netherlands can benefit from, but uh, we can benefit from it all over the world. And I uh, 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 want to bring out a local example over here. I live in Friesland uh, and we have many farmers over here. And uh, there are many people who say that farmers, for example, are big co contributors uh, of, uh, of pollution of the environment. But at the same time, innovation brings us to a point in which three farms can supply uh, now a, a six villages of, uh, of green gases. Uh, and I really feel that when technology goes further and further, we can make enormous changes in making sure that we have a more circular way of living uh, in which we can enjoy a bread of cheese uh, or a glass of milk, but at the same time know that our houses are heated uh, in a sustainable way, uh, making sure that uh, we use all the processes in a more optimum uh, way. And um, uh, I feel that those kind of innovations happen in the Netherlands. We should be really proud of that. We should export it. We should market it. And we should also make sure that uh, people all across the world know that when it comes to farming, we have one of the most uh, efficient, sustainable uh, farms uh, in the world. Uh, thank you so much. I, I don't want to enter into the topic of stickstoff or nitrogen because that would simply take up uh, too much time uh, at this point and we're already running out of time. So um, we've had our uh, uh, discussions and debates on these four themes, uh, which brings us to almost the last part of, of, of tonight's evening, uh, which is the final one and a half minute um, uh, elevator pitches in which uh, all of the political representatives can, can convince uh, you as, uh, as, as uh, uh, watchers of this evening why you should vote for their party and perhaps even uh, give them a preference vote or, or forecast them. So uh, we started uh, at the beginning with Ruben. So let's this time start the um, uh, last round of one and a half minute elevator pitches with uh, Mikkel Tsegai from the PVDA. Mikkel, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, my parents came to the Netherlands uh, from Eritrea 30 years ago. And with this small leap of faith, I could have been born in Eritrea and 
have been an Eritrean refugee by now, but I'm not. And I've experienced many things in my life that made me realize that I had a lot of luck. But I believe in a society where you're not, um, where, <laughs> where your chances don't depend on luck, but where you get equal chances no matter where you are born or where your parents are from or what their income is. And that's why I want to be a part of the uh, Dutch National Parliament, because I want to fight for that. I want to fight for equal chances for all children in the Netherlands. I want to make sure that there is more affordable housing in the Netherlands, that everyone can get a job and that we uh, have a better world uh, through sustainable development. If you want to uh, hear a young voice of our generation in the National Parliament, and I think it's necessary because the average age right now in our Parliament is 48, uh, you should vote for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's very good that you mentioned the, the average age uh, in the parliament, because I think all of the, the, the party representatives here today uh, are, are very young and dynamic candidates. So in that sense, uh, it's good that the people here have so much uh, uh, opportunities to choose from. Um, so I would now like to give the floor to Bibi uh, from Vol. Uh, you have the floor. We've talked about a lot tonight. And gladly, from my perspective, we've talked a lot about the EU. And somehow, incredibly, we've agreed a lot about the EU. That makes me very happy, but it also makes me very hopeful that somehow, even though we haven't seen a lot of cooperation or need for cooperation in the past, we may will see it in the future. But personally, I am part of a European party, but I have my own goals too. I'm 19 and with your support, I plan to be the youngest uh, national politician in national parliament ever. And that's not just because I wanna represent young people, it's because I wanna represent a unique perspective, that of a young woman. I wanna represent the voices that have not been heard a lot, which create a lot of weird policies made by old men, which should have been viewed, processed and made by younger women. So personally, I represent a European party, but I also represent the views of a lot of women that have not been heard on issues like sexual intimidation, uh, reform in, in uh, sexual education in schools, um, and in general representation of more young women in our Dutch parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bibi. Uh, now I would like to, to give the floor to uh, Stephanie from GroenLinks. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, GroenLinks is Green Party, but it's also a left-wing party. And GroenLinks is the only party that combines the ideal of equality, a fair society, and caring for people that are more vulnerable with fighting for a healthy climate and reversing climate crisis. A vote for GroenLinks uh, will assure you that uh, you support a political party that operates from firm beliefs and principles, but also a party that stays realistic and makes a lot of efforts to bring these ideals into practice. We represent a lot of different people and be, we're uh, a very diverse and inclusive party. And that's one of our main focuses. You can see it when you look at our list. All sorts of people are on it and it's not just only middle-aged men <laughs> with all due respect. Uh, so if you want more power for a party or to a party that fights for equality and wants to save our climate, go and vote for GroenLinks. And if you vote for me, you'll definitely know that that's on my list as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, from the city, yeah, you have the floor. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, as I started out uh, with my reason to enter politics, I also want to conclude with it uh, by saying that uh, I, I know that I've gotten amazing chances to grow up in the Netherlands, even though I'm not born here. Uh, and also that for, the, for a fact, I know that <coughs> When, when, when I um, uh, look at politics, I really want to make a contribution to it, to make uh, uh, the world a, a little bit cooler and society with a little bit uh, more warm. Uh, so healing fractures that divide us and, and making sure that uh, populations in the Netherlands that now find each other at opposite sides, find each other again. And uh, making sure that uh, uh, we see uh, maybe that there are some differences between us, but that our goals are common for each and every one of us. 
so if you uh, agree with that, uh, please vote yeah, Bjonkers. Thank you, Yap, for your, for your elevator pitch. And then it brings us to the, the last uh, elevator pitch. We've had quite a few elevator pitches. I, I, I know this, this has been a feature of, of, of tonight's debate, but uh, please join me in the, the, the final elevator pitch all the way to the, to the top floor of uh, the Dutch parliament. Uh, Ruben uh, Brekomans, you have the floor. Thank you, Maarten. And, and also, because I'm the last one speaking, let me take this opportunity to thank you all for participating tonight. I think it's great that you took the time to discuss these, uh, these issues with us. Um, I, I, I heard some people talk about middle-aged men. I don't consider myself to be middle-aged. It was not so long ago that I studied development economics myself, then global politics, and also public administration. And I studied many of the things that we discussed tonight. And there were many ideas and ideals that I that I have uh, and I still have but when you start working and when you um, for example I worked at the World Bank when you work at a big institution like that and when you go to a country like Jordan or Lebanon talk about the refugee uh, crisis for example with the government there uh, when you go to the e to Brussels as I did to negotiate about migration then you see how difficult it is to get to results because there are so many interests at play and as a small country like the Netherlands, you really need to work hard to get things done. So as we started our discussion in the beginning, it's important to have principles, to, um, to have ideals to make it a better world. But you also need to be realistic. And it's important to, uh, to get results and to get things done. So if you want to have a combination, then take your chance. Vote Brekelmans. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ruben, for, for your last elevator pitch. Uh, that also brings us uh, to, to the end of, of tonight. We actually have one final question for our audience, because it can very well be the case that after watching this, uh, this, this debate that you have perhaps seen a different perspective or heard a different uh, voice that you haven't heard before. So perhaps now you consider voting for a different party as a result of, of watching this debate. And because of uh, that opportunity, we're now going to have a little uh, uh, poll uh, in which uh, you can uh, tell us uh, whether you've had a, a different, whether you consider voting for a, a different party as a result of uh, uh, of this debate. I assume that the representatives of the political party are still convinced that they are at the, at the, at the right party, uh, but uh, you never know. Huh? Uh, perhaps in the next elections we'll see uh, people have seen switched. Um, the poll closed after 13 votes, so I'm not sure. Uh... How does it? Oh, no. Well, at least we have two people who said yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit of a pity that it closed after closed so quick. Let's do oh, it again. There it is again. I see a lot more votes right now as well. Yes. So I think uh, there was a bit of a technical glitch before, but. Uh... I, I urge everyone to vote because, I mean, why not? <laughs> let's, let's stop at 40 seconds. All right. Or 30. Can we stop? Yeah. Sure. All right. Aha, look, that's, that's much better. So <laughs> we have 17 uh, people actually uh, having changed their vote rather than two, which is uh, 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 a bit more optimistic. So it means that. Uh, it could be a good thing or a bad thing for the for the people uh, of this uh, of their party. We we will never know. Uh, the, the the moment we will know is of course uh, the 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 moment that the election results uh, are known of of the upcoming elections. Um, so the only thing I can say as a neutral uh, moderator, despite of course invitations to join respective parties, is that whatever your opinion is, make sure to get out and vote. I think that is the the most important thing. And also perhaps we can agree with the people in this room that we are going to convince five other friends of us to also vote. Because uh, if we convince everyone, five other people to vote, then we can already have a very big influence and make sure that people who are otherwise perhaps think, you know, this is not important, actually are represented in, in Dutch politics uh, from now. So that was it from, from, from my side as, as your moderator. I am now going to uh, pass back uh, the word to the, the organizers uh, of this evening, but, uh, all I can say is that I enjoyed it a lot uh, moderating this debate. I think we've heard lots of uh, interesting uh, arguments from both sides. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing more of these debates, hopefully 
with extensive foreign policy uh, positions debated as well uh, going forward. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for moderating tonight. Uh, it's very nice to have you as one of our former members here uh, moderating one of the events. Um, and I definitely agree that everybody who is here should go out and vote next month. I think the elections are on the 17th, as far as I'm aware. Um, and then obviously I want to thank um, all five of the candidates that are here tonight. Um, good luck to you and your parties during the elections. And thank you very much for coming. Um, lastly, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Eggers uh, from the University of Groningen and also uh, Marluz from GSG for organizing this event with us um, and for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, with that,